All right, everybody, I think we're good now, right? Can you hear us? We're back with Effective Communication Skills Training live with Dan O'Connor and Andrew. Say hi, Andrew. <laughs> so what do you think about the uh, sound now? Is everything, oh, we didn't put in our microphone. Uh, what do you think about the video? Is, are we back in good graces with the video gods? What does it sound like, Andrew? I can't see the video. No? Okay. Welcome to live chat. We were just waiting for a con confirmation. Oh, sounds good. Great. Everything sounds good. Yeah. They're telling us. Dot com. Okay. So we are going to start out today again. We're going to restart. <laughs> just a moment. Okay. How's that sound, everybody? Good? We're going to restart with dealing with narcissistic coworkers. What do you think about that? Sound good? Sound good. All right. Remember these things when you're dealing with narcissistic coworkers. It's kind of like all communication situations where you really want to take it to the next level. We have to do a few things before we talk about specific strategies. So we're going to talk first about theory. Then we're going to get into specific, like, what can I say to them? First of all, remember this. When you're dealing with difficult people, especially narcissists, what do you think, Andrew? If I had to choose, you can keep, you can keep doing that while we, while we talk through this. We can choose from the following options when, it's, when we're deciding what our goal is, okay? Our goal is to, number one, teach them a lesson. Number two, get them to move along and find a new victim down the hallway. Number three, wait a minute, teach them a lesson, find a new victim, or number three, uh, oh, show them, get them to understand what we are thinking. Okay, so what do you think? Everybody out there, what, which one of those three options is correct? Should we teach them a lesson, get them to understand us, or get them to go ahead and find a new victim down the hallway? Think about that one. What do you think, Andrew? Uh, I would teach them a lesson. Wrong, Andrew! We'll keep them around anyway. <laughs> so what we want to remember is it is principle. It's not my job to teach anyone else a lesson. It is my job to learn lessons. Okay, so I have to remember that. And I can't change a difficult person, right? I cannot do that. It is not a possibility. And especially a true narcissist does not care, nor will they ever go along with my way of thinking. What they want is confirmation that I understand them. And you know habit number five in the habits of highly affected people? Habit number five is, if I'm going to be an effective person, I want to seek first to understand other people, right? So what I want to do is, it's kind of like, you know, the opposite of our intuition. We tend to want to teach these people lessons and we tend to want them to get them to understand, you know, what's really going on here. We can't do either one of those things. I, however, want to listen to the narcissist so that I can understand what it is that they want me to get about them and then feed that back to them and let them know I understand you. So number one, Andrew, the first thing we're going to do is, okay. Uh, that's okay, did you leave that? The number one thing we're going to do is understand them. I want to know what it is that you want me to know about you. And I realize that narcissists can go on forever. However, it's kind of like, you know what, you know what it's like, you know, when, when you want somebody to get it, you know, to understand what it is that you feel. Like, uh, Andrew, who's your best friend? Amen. Amen? Okay, so you know when you, Amen's my nephew, hi Amen, when you have a bad day, Andrew, or when you have a good day, when you have a great day, when you get, like, if you, if you win a prize, if you, uh, you know, have a new relationship, you want to call Amen and have him join in the party with you, right? Like, you want to call him up and have him celebrate your successes, correct? Yes. We can't see your head, so you have to dip down. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yes, we want our best friends to celebrate with us. And when you are having a horrible day or when somebody dumps, you've been dumped, Andrew? Uh, no, no. That's nice, good for you. When you are dumped, those of us who have been dumped, you know, 
you want to call up your best friend and have them join in your pity party. You know, it is basic human nature that we want other people to feel the way we feel. Narcissists, however, have that. It's a little bit grotesque. You know what I mean? It's a little bit, uh, <laughs> I'm saying a little to be kind. It is blown out of proportion. They want other people to know, they want other people to feel exactly what they feel, but what they feel, no one else could possibly feel to begin with. But they're going to try to get you to feel the way they feel. And what they want is at least confirmation that you understand and you get it. Therefore, I want to, first of all, understand them. Number two, I want to then relate to them. Because So number one is I have to practice to seek to first to understand then to be understood. The then to be understood part, however, does not come into play here. I'm going to seek to understand them. And then number two, convey to them that I get it, what it is that they're trying to teach me. You know, I'm going to somehow relate to you. I'm picking up what you're putting down. Having said that, I wanted to throw in here a little bit of style stepping. Remember that style stepping is learning to speak other people's language. And the effective communicator always, always learns to speak the language of the person with whom they are communicating. If I, for example, um, go to, where do we have any countries online right now that speak a different language? Uh, let me see. Let's say, what? Uh, India. India. Let's say that I am going to India and I want to really woo the president of the company with whom I'm communicating. And uh, Hindi, is that one of the languages that they speak there? Uh, Urdu? Urdu? Is that, is that right? I, I think so. Okay, so I'm going to go with Hindi or Urdu. If I really want to connect with that person, one of the first things I'm going to do is learn to say hello or, uh, you know, welcome or thank you for having me in that person's language to connect with them. Just like if I want to try a case in front of Judge Judy, one of the things I need to do to be effective is learn how to speak legalese. If I want to go into a doctor's office and convince them that I know what I have before they do, I want to learn the language of medicine. You know, if I want to have a romantic evening in the bedroom and I want you to get on board with my, you know, romantic desires, I want to learn to speak the language of love. But many times we do not do that. We speak our own language. We want other people to understand us. So especially in the case of the narcissist, which is blown out of proportion and is, uh, you know, out of, out of control, this urge that they have to want other people to understand them. I want to learn how to style step and speak their language. Their language is about what? Is about them. And, you know, our own ego, we all have our ego, right? We all have it. I want to put mine aside because the effective communicator, along with, you know, the effective person in, in relationships and in life, is going to always do his or her cost benefit analysis. You know, I can choose to be kind or I can choose to be right sometimes. We can't always have it all at the same time. I mean, you know, Oprah, Oprah told me, Dan, I mean, I, I, I inserted that name when I was watching her on television. You can have it all, but not at the same time. You know, and if Oprah, if Oprah can't have it all at the same time, a mere mortal like Dan O'Connor, I can't either. Therefore, I have to choose sometimes. I can choose to be right sometimes or to be kind sometimes. I can't always choose to be both of those things at the same time. I can choose to be effective or I can choose to feed my ego. It's very rare that we can be effective when we are feeding our ego, right? But anytime, anytime we want to feed our ego and get other people to acknowledge what we feel or you know what we want or understand us, I tend to be choosing the ineffective path. So I want to understand the narcissist, Tell them in their own language by style stepping is number two. Style step, is, do we put that down? Relate to them. Perfect. Well, that's another way of saying it, right? So we want to relate to them using style stepping. Yes. So, uh, and oh, look at, look at Andrew as an artist. He can choose to be kind or choose to be right. That's perfect. Once I do that, what will happen is it's just like all of us. Once I feel that my best friend has joined my pity party, or has joined with me in the celebration. I get unstuck and then I can move along. The same is true for the narcissist. Once they feel as though you get it, they will get unstuck and move along to the next victim. We have to play the odds, you know what I mean? We have to. 
And the odds are that once they feel as though they have conquered you, I have increased the odds that you will then move to someone else. Now, if this is my boss, because somebody said, what if it's your boss? There's nothing wrong with me saying, you know, things like, wow, you did a great job, even though you had nothing to do with it. Because many times when we are dealing with the narcissist, for example, we think to ourselves, I'm not going to tell you that. You know, we know what they want to hear. You know, you know what I'm talking about. We know what the narcissist wants to hear. Therefore, we withhold that from the narcissist. And we think and we think to ourselves and, you know, behave as if, uh uh-uh, no, I am not going to give you what you want. What if we did? You know, imagine the possibility that we are, what, what would happen if we gave the narcissist what they want to hear? How is that any different from giving our spouse what they want or giving our boyfriend or girlfriend what they want or asking others to communicate with us in the way that we want? You know, I have my own, <laughs> I have my own quirks, right? I have my own issues that I expect other people to deal with. You know, I have the way that I want people to communicate with me and treat me, and I expect other people to do that. What is so different about a narcissist that wants us to talk about them and relate everything to them? You know, sometimes, you know about the different personality types? Most of us have gone through the type of training, the personality training. If you have not, check out my website, danoconnortraining.com, or uh, I'll even do on-sites on just the four personality types. Depending on what you call them, there's the analytical person, the one that wears tan pants and drives an old clunker car, or there's the star, the uh, amiable type of person, uh, excuse me, the star type of person, the, the expressive, I should say, type of person, where they're, they wear lots of colors and they wear things that make noise and draw attention, uh, and they tend to drive like a, a Cadillac Escalade. We have the driver type which tends to drive a Nissan or a Toyota. They wear lots of gray and black, like I'm wearing today. We have the lover types. The lover types, they wear like sweatshirts with a, you know, greatest grandkid picture on it. And then you ask them, oh, is that your grandchild? And they'll say, no, I just thought it was cute. I saw it at the thrift store. Uh, And they tend to drive cars that you put a lot of people in, you know, like vans. When you learn to style step and speak those four languages, we are doing that so that we can be more effective and we can shift our language with each one of the types in after 15 minutes of training. You know what I mean? If I'm unconscious about my communication, I'm going around talking to everybody the way that, that I want to be talked with. Like, you know, there are four types. Hey, okay? if you draw a T chart, like draw, draw a big letter, draw a big plus sign. I should have said plus sign. Okay. On the top left hand side, we're going to put the, the star. Okay. So the star. Yep. But beneath that, put a heart for the lover. Okay, to the right-hand side, put a, uh, put a, a, draw a a book. (laughs) Okay. Okay, they're going to be the analytical type. And above that, put a car for the driver. Okay. If I didn't know any better, I am... By the way, if anyone would like to send me a monitor where we can do this type of thing and Andrew can draw on it and it shows up in real time, I would so promote that for you. You just have no idea. So if I am unconsciously communicating, I'm going through life as I am the driver type. I'm a competitive person and I like to have little trophies around me that tell you what I'm good at. And I like to, you know, I want to take those trophies to the grave. I tend to speak material language. And if I don't know any better, I'm talking to the star about what the goal is and how we can achieve it. And I'm talking to the lover the same way. And I'm talking to the analytical type the same way. We can win if we do it this way. We can be number one if we do it this way. However, I'm not connecting with them because I am speaking my language. I'm saying this is important to me. However, After five minutes, I can learn, oh, if I simply shift that to, if I'm talking to the lover, this is important to us. We can do X, Y, Z. Or if I'm talking to the star, I can say, you will be seen as 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 the effective professional that I know you to be. If I'm talking to the analytical type, this will help, this will help you learn. This will help you grow, but 
I would not say that in front of other people because they don't like that. You know, I can learn little tiny things in five minutes so that I can suddenly start speaking the language of other people. Or, Andrew, you know what it's like. If you're going to say to me, Dan, now by the way, this is all about the narcissist. We, sty we style step all the time. Andrew, if you were to say to me, uh -huh. do you understand what I'm saying, Dan? But say it in a way that is using a different language. Like, how do you say to Eamon when, you're, when you want him to, you know, when you're spot checking him, are you listening to me? Do you understand what I'm saying? You might say to him something like, <laughs> does that blank good? Like, does that, if you're going to, if you're going to ask Eamon for confirmation, like, hey, are you on the same page of, with me? Are you on board? Mm -hmm. Does that good? What do you say? Does that sound good? Does that sound good? Now, just because he answered that way, I'm going to guess that Andrew is a more auditory learner. He likes to learn by hearing and he likes to communicate by, with words. If he had said to me, um, does that look good? I would have guessed him to be a more visual person who wants to see things and read things and write things. He might say, uh, for example, do you get it? Uh, how does that feel to you? You know, are you feeling me? Like if you ever watch Dr. Phil, uh, Dr. Phil is always saying, you know, things like, hey, you know, you seem to be going off the side of the road and we're trying to pull you back, but you're not coming. Are you picking up what I'm putting down? And Dr. Phil, because he says that, would be what type of personality of those three that we have discussed. There's the kinesthetic type, which is feeling. There's the auditory type, which is hearing. And then there's the visual type, seeing. So which one of the three would Dr. Phil be based on what I just said? What do you think? What are people saying, Andrew? <laughs> Not Dr. Kinesthetic. Phil. Kinesthetic. He's kinesthetic. Now, by the way, I use Dr. Phil as a reference because I think it's obvious the language that he speaks. I'm not a big fan of Dr. Phil. I'm just not, okay? So just, you could be, and I don't have anything against him. I'm not. When you hear him speak, however, it is obvious that he's kinesthetic because he talks about how things feel, how things, uh, you know, move. I know now when I'm talking to him, for example, if I want to get confirmation from him on how he looks at an issue, how he sees something, what he thinks about something, I'm going to say to him, how do you feel about that? Rather than, what do you think about that? Because kinesthetic people tend to make decisions based on their gut. And if I said to Dr. Phil, for example, if I'm working with him, you know, good example, because I don't, I don't particularly think the way he does or appreciate his flow of this <laughs> train of thought because I do not is the purpose, per perfect opportunity for me to learn and think I'm going to start learning what his speech patterns are so that I can figure out how to connect with him. And if I were to say to him, what do you think about that? He would more than other people be stumped and be like, I don't know, you know, I'm not really sure. And I'm not getting the answer that I want that I could more quickly get if I were to simply say, how do you feel about that? You know, ah, uh, Kinesthetic people might talk about the way things smell. You know, that something smells fishy or, you know what I mean? If I want him to relate to what I'm saying. Therefore, the narcissist, just like any other extreme personality type, has his or her own language. They have their speech patterns. If what your goal is, is to get them unstuck so they can go, you know, find the next victim up the hall so that we can do our jobs, speak their language. And then you will notice they will get unstuck, stop trying to teach you things because you get it. You see that they are the superstar of the world. And that's okay because anyone who is sane, you know, who is a, who is a, 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 of a sci, sound mind and body, when they look at things done, who fake that, whether I am or whether I am not. The people who I need to recognize it are going to recognize it, they are not. I can't do anything about it based on that person other than impress people with my ability to communicate with them and work with the narcissist. So remember, if, you're not, if you are working with a narcissist, if you do not find a way to work with them, meaning you're going to have to stroke their ego a little bit more, you're going to have to say things like, you did a great job, you know, way to go when they have nothing to do with things. And by the way, generally they do, you know, especially if they're your boss like it or not, they do have a lot to do with what's going on, you know? So if other people see you doing that, that will be such a feather in your cap. And if you do not, if you decide, for example, I'm just going to quit my job, I'm going to escape that person, I'm going to change departments, whatever it may be, take it to the bank, they will manifest again. They will be the same person with a different name. 
and you will keep having to deal with them over and over and over. And this will become one of your cycles in life until you work through whatever issue it is that is bringing up in you. Because remember that the narcissist is just a difficult person like any other difficult person, they are your master teacher in disguise. They are trying to help you work through something that you have in you. Maybe it's that you need a little bit more reinforcement than you should. And so you don't like giving it away to them. Give it away. Work through the issue. And once you work through the issue, once you have mastered it and said, ha ha, difficult person, you have no power over here, over me. I have dominion. Once you have shown that and you feel that and you work through the issues that they are bringing up in you, not about them, it is about you. Once you have done that, then they will naturally fall away and you then can get unstuck yourself and move along and start dealing with even more difficult people and other issues because you will have grown past that one. So that's what I have to say about that. Now we will talk about more strategies specifically for dealing with them. You know, what are some power phrases that I can use, danger phrases to avoid? That is going to be an upcoming uh, episode because we are moving along to our next topic, which is what, Andrew? By the way, what type of comments or things do we have so far that I might want to address? Okay, uh, they talk about Dr. Phil. <laughs> What's with the Dr. Phil comments? <laughs> what, what, what are they saying? Uh, did you ever watch Jeremy Kyle? I don't know who Jeremy Kyle is. Who's Jeremy Kyle? I don't know either. Andrew doesn't know. And if Andrew does not know, he's not of the celebrity top ten. What's a flame bojant? What's a what? Flame bojant. Flame bojant? I think it's... Okay. Fajan? I don't know. How's it spelled? Uh, B-O-Y-A-N-T. A flame buoyant? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Is that some type of weird... Is that, is that an insult? Or is that a... I don't know. We don't know what a flame... A, 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 a buoyant? Flame? Uh, yeah. You've stumped Andrew. I don't know. But uh, what's, what's, what's the next one? Okay, <laughs> he says, what's the best way to increase social intelligence? Oh, the best way to increase social intelligence. Well, let's, let me start off this way. If your goal is to increase your social intelligence, chances are, because you want to do that, you are going to be in the book quadrant, you know, you're going to be the, uh, <laughs> thank you, Andrew. you're going to be in the, what are the analytical quadrant of the, you know, we are all a mixture of the four types, but we have a dominant side, you know, like the perfect mix of personality is going to be a dot right in the middle. You want to go down just a little bit, unless you just want people to focus on <laughs> That's perfect. You know, that is the perfect mix because people will say to me, well, I'm, you know, what, I'm like really a mix of all four. We all are, but you're going to have one of those four quadrants that rears his or her head more often, that is the more dominant type. So you, chances are, if you want to learn more about other types, you are the director, you are the, excuse me, analytical type. What I recommend doing is partnering with a, uh, uh, what do you call that? What was the, the big, the star type? I would partner with that type. I would not try and increase your social intelligence so much as I would partner with somebody who is naturally social and socially intelligent. Now, I would, for your own learning and for your you know, development as a, as a person, I would encourage you to study what I recommend is the Enneagram. The Enneagram is, a, is an ancient personality profiling system. All of the personality systems that we use today have been created basically in the past 50, 60 years. There's none of, none of them are new. And they're all based on the same thing. Those four quadrants, all of them, every single one. Uh, they ask, what is social intelligence? Social intelligence is knowing about people. You know, there's, in, in the extremes, there's going to be people who are very analytical, meaning I can take a math equation and I can, I can I, I'll kill it. You know, I can tell you, how the universe talks to one another because the universal language is mathematics. And so if I am a very intelligent, there are many core types. There are two core types to begin with. You know, there's men, there's women, there's socially intelligent, there is analytical, analytically intelligent. Those are gonna be two polar opposites, all right? So if you are very socially intelligent, naturally, 
you will be able to relate to people. You will, we were talking about and we were talking about someone and their ability to just naturally relate to people. Like we were uh, Olga and I. Uh, Olga might stop in today. She might be on time. And Olga, Olga and I were talking about you know he's he's got that thing where he can naturally pick up on what other people want to see and hear what they want, and he'll give it to them. And that is a gift. That's smart. You know, like he will go very far in life because he knows how to do that and might not have even ever put his finger on it that he knows how to do that. The opposite side of the scale are going to be people who are very good at, you know, maybe fixing my computer, uh, knowing how to study uh, and, you know, knowing mathematics, for example. Those people will look at the socially intelligent people and be like, wow, I want to, I want some of that. The socially intelligent people who tend to be, who are more, who are more uh, likely to be narcissists <laughs> will look at the analytical people and think, wow, if I had some of, if I had more of that, you know, I would be able to rule the world. But socially intelligent people are those who can naturally understand the, the dynamics that we've been talking about here today. They don't need anybody to teach it to them. They get it. They might not be able to you know, spell it out the way we can, but if you can harness analytical intelligence and social intelligence and put them together, you really, there's no stopping you. That said, to the person who asked how to increase your social intelligence, Study personality types, as we're talking about today, I recommend the Enneagram because I was saying how the personality types, really, they're all new. The, the, excuse me, all of the systems are new based on the same four quadrants. The only one that is different is the Enneagram. And that's an ancient system that you know was passed along verbally by the Sufis for many years until somebody recently wrote it down and put it into more modern terms. Uh, when I say you know recently, maybe 100 years ago, uh, but it's been around for thousands of years. It's the most accurate that I have ever found. Uh, when you study the Enneagram, if you're an analytical type, what it will help you do is you can look at somebody and each one of the nine types has 20 things, like a checklist that you can go through. And if you go through the, they're not the same, you know, like many of the personality systems, they'll say, well, do you this and that? And you're like, well, anybody would say yes to that. How do you spell the book you just said? Well, it's not a book. The Enneagram is a system, and many different people have written about it, and it's spelled E N N E N N E A E A G R A M E R A M. Yeah, Enneagram, and it looks like it's a devil worshiping system because <laughs> because it has a it, 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 draw a pentagram like a star. Okay, now put a circle around it. Okay, that's what it. That's what you'll see on the cover of the book. And you'll be like, what is Dan O'Connor recommending devil stuff for? That's not it at all. It is, it, that's how the system works. It has points that, you know, relate to one another. But that is the Enneagram. And it's a wonderful system that you can, as an analytical type, learn so that you can identify other people. And then, like, for example, here's how, here's how you can practically apply social intelligence. I have... Uh, not a large family, but there are a lot of people in my family. In my family is small. You might have met my brother Marty, maybe. Uh, Marty is a is, is a trainer sometimes with me. He's socially gifted. He likes people. He's very uh, very good at using social tools online. I'm not. I had to ask him how do you. <laughs> I had to ask my brother how do you look like you care? Because he was saying, Dan, you have to actually care about other people. And I'm like, okay, how do you do that? How do you look that way? And I'm not saying I don't. I'm saying I don't know how to demonstrate to people on a practical everyday basis that I care about them the way he does. I mean, he is, wouldn't you say so, Andrew, that he's a very magnetic person and uh, that people are drawn to my brother because of his social skills? Yeah, he's a fun person. Yeah, I mean, okay, well, I'm so, so. But now, now I... I have always admired my brother for that, and I'm much more of an analytical type by nature, and so I have studied the tactics that I've seen him use, and I've tried to implement them so that I can also connect with people the way that he does, and I'll never be able to the way he does. So what should I do is I'll learn about as much as I can, but I will partner with people who find it natural. So that's what I would encourage you to do, and I know that that was a huge answer for such a simple question, but I never, when I take a, a, a skills test, you know, like a, an aptitude test, 
I remember I have a I'm a I'm a stockbroker and, and a investment banker. That was one of the first things that I did starting out in my career. And when I had to take a test to be an investment banker, the test was a personality test and I failed it and they did not give me the job. And I had to retake it three times trying to figure out how to work the test so that I could appear as though I have a personality that would be good for this job. And I finally, I got it. I'm the puzzle master. So I figured out how to ace the test. But what I should have known at the time, and I know now, is what would be much better is not to try and improve some area in which I am weak. Because I would put a whole lot of effort into a very little bit of success. Because if it's naturally a weakness of mine, it's always going to be naturally a weakness of mine. What I should do is find somebody who's naturally gifted in that area and say, why don't we work together? Together we can rule the world. And let that person pick up the slack where I am weak. And I will do that for that person. And, you know, it's like the wonder twin powers activating, you know. So that's what I recommend. Studying it, like, you know, if we're talking about in terms of percentages, I would say that your, your winning strategy for learning about social intelligence would be 90% surrounding yourself with people who are socially intelligent and 10% learning about social intelligence. Okay. What other do we have? Uh, if I have trouble engaged in socially with new people, which course of dance does Dan recommend? If you have trouble engaging with people when you first meet them, I recommend, I have a, I have a course called uh, Step Out of the Shadows and Speak, and it's my flagship course. The reason I recommend that is because it encompasses everything that I teach, a little bit of everything. You can get it on audio for, you know what, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to post in the comments of this video a 50% uh, off coupon. Ha ha! So that you can get it if you're a viewer here uh, at 50% off. Give me a minute to do that once we are done. Okay? Or write Jean. No, even better, even better, even better. If you <laughs> wanted to do this. If you write Jean at J-E-A-N at danoconnertraining.com, she will give you a coupon for 50% off of either the audio version or the audio plus video plus worksheets version of that course. And you can get it for in a very, very cheap. Um, or because that, that'll talk about the personality types. That'll talk about danger phrases and power phrases. That talks about how to relate to people in person, on the phone, in writing. If you struggle with that, that's what I would go for. Uh, we also have a VIP pass that you can get, which will give you access to everything I ever have digitally. And that's, we, we, she can also give you a 50% coupon for that. And that only turns out to be like 350 bucks, I think. And it entitles you to access to everything forever. So you might like that too. Um, what else do we have? Oh, Remember, Gene okay. at danlegarnetraining.com will give anybody who asks for it a 50% off coupon within the next 48 hours. How do I address a covered loving, love bombing narc? <laughs> I don't want to give in and be passive to their nice. What? Uh, say that again. A what? Loving narc? A love bombing narc. Oh, I, I, I thank you for reminding me to repeat Andrew's questions. How do I address a love bombing narc? Narc. Narcissist. Narcissist! Thank you. I thought I'm like a narc. Do, are you selling something you shouldn't? Okay. Uh, a love bombing narc? Narc. Narcissist. Narcissist. Uh -huh. A love bombing narcissist? What does that mean? Uh, no. Do you mean like, how do I... Say that again. So the whole thing. Okay. Uh, how do I address a covered love bombing narc? I don't want to give in and be passive to their niceness. Okay, I'm not really sure. Please, if you can write that question about how do I deal with a love-covered narcissist bomb or something, if you could rephrase that, I don't, I don't understand the question. Um, but I do understand this part of it. When you say I don't want to give in to their niceness, that's the part that tells me where the real issue is. If you, I'm <laughs> sorry, but if you are resisting, for example, I don't want to give them what they want. Why not? You know, what is holding you back from doing that? Don't you want them to give you what you want? That's what I'm hearing. You know, I'm hearing that you want something from them. You want a certain behavior from them that you are not getting. At the same time, you're saying, I'm not going to give them what they want. That's the problem. We can only, we, we, the only thing that is missing from any one of our relationships is what we are not giving. That's it.
There's no exception to that rule. I have a program called the nine principles. Uh, and it's about the nine principles that you can apply to heal any relationship and move past these things that we get stuck in. One of the principles is if you see that something's missing, like, you know, they just don't understand. They aren't getting it. They are treating me with lovelessness. Well, the only thing that can heal that is what you're not giving. Are you sure it's not you that's doing that? You know, if, if you're saying to yourself, no, I can't give in to them. Why? You know, you want them to behave a certain way. Maybe it is you who needs to behave a certain way and try to understand them. You know, if they're not being professional, really? Maybe, maybe it's you who could be more professional and start implementing professional strategies that help you communicate more effectively with these people. Now, I'm not saying that is you. I'm saying whatever the issue is, that is you. You know, whatever it is that you believe that they should be doing or saying or the, the, what is missing from that relationship, it is only you who could possibly give it. Or else, it's not missing because that's not the way the universe works. Okay. Uh, how did you get into what, you're, what you are doing now? How did I get into what I'm doing now? I, I, was, <laughs> I, was, getting, I was teaching down in Mexico uh, because I lost my mind. And I saw a palm tree for the first time, okay? I was down here with my mother. And I, if you know my mother, she used to be a nun. My dad used to be a Christian brother. And they got together and had, you know, my brother and me. And 10 months apart. So we came down here because my mom, let's call, let's do a, oh, let's remember, we're going to do a call mom section today. That'll be good, okay? Uh, uh, oh, actually, I think she's watching live. Hi, mom. If you are, um, uh, we're not calling you. Okay. So I went down to Mexico with my mom and one of her lovers. And, and so I saw for the first time, I was out of the Midwest and I saw a palm tree and I saw the ocean and I'm like, my brother and I both, actually, when we arrived, it was in the middle of the night, and we said to one another, we're like, have you ever seen such huge plastic plants? How did you get these big fake palm trees in here? I've not, that, that's, so, that's a lot of plastic. And we were like, how did that happen? And we were convinced everything was fake. Then when the sun came up, we realized, holy moly, this are, these are real palm trees, and that's the ocean, and these are mountains that I'd never seen ever before. And so I said, I can't go home or I shall jump off the roof of the Equitable Building, which is where I was stealing uh, stocks and bonds in Chicago. And so I took the little money I had and I said, I'm staying here in Mexico. My family thought that I lost my mind. And I said, I'm going to stay here as long as I can. And it ended up working out where I, I got a job teaching. And the, as I was teaching, I started to, they asked me to do some more public stuff. And I'm like, okay, uh, then I needed to send some clients some videos of me. And I did that through YouTube, which was new to me. And I realized people were watching them and, you know, making all this kind of, it was, you know, if you look at, if you look at my first videos on YouTube, you'll see the ones I'm talking about. I was screaming and yelling at the audience because I wanted to get their attention so that I could slip in some information. And so then uh, they started to become more and more popular. And I said, you know, what's this monetize button here all about? And so I clicked the monetize button in YouTube and started to receive checks and was like, hey, this is great. And so I started to do more of that. And... I realized that I could reach more people and that they, they're, when you have a message, you know, that's not of you, but it's in you, you know what I'm talking about? Like when I speak, I try to say to the universe, you know, please erase what is in my brain so that I don't come with an agenda and please put in its stead what you think or what these people really need to hear. And so I will try to deliver that message. <laughs> this buddy, we're gonna get him in here. Uh, and. I felt like it was what I was supposed to do. And so it's how I got started because the more I would deliver the messages, the more avenues started to open up and help me stay on that path rather than trade stocks and bonds, which was a loser path for me. Uh, that's not what I was supposed to be doing. However, it, I, I can see how it all worked together to help me uh, sit here today and talk to you. So it got started by my mother, who's a little bit cray cray and loosey goosey. Okay, your mother says, I wish I had spoken more lovingly to my wonderful mother. Well, I wish you did too, Mom. Uh, but <laughs> my, mother, my mother says that she wishes that she had spoken more lovingly to her mother. Or well, that you had. Well, that I had? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't think so. Um, so after about, by the way, just so you know the rest of the story, after I was here in Mexico, I had found my peace and, you know, paradise, and I'm like, I've done it. I am in paradise at peace. I have carved out my own 
you know, place in the sun for myself and was enjoying every moment of the day. Then my mother moved into my backyard and brought the whole circus with her, with her husband, her, well, her, my dad, her new husband, my brother, his wife, their child, my aunt Katie decided to pitch a tent for a while. And they all, there went my piece in life. So there you go. If you think that you can run from your problems, I mean, your family, your, if you, if you think you can do that, you can't. They will. Like I was saying, if you try and just push a problem aside <laughs> without dealing the issues that it's bringing up in you, it will re-manifest in front of you. You cannot escape the issues that the universe is putting in front of you. So they came here, and there goes my piece. Ten years ago. Okay, what do you know about communication that you wish you, know, you knew before you started teaching it? What do I know about communication now that I wish I had known when I started teaching it? I wish I knew that... I wish I knew the importance of being loving. That's what I, that's what I wish. Okay, I'm starting a new job in two weeks as a lead engineer. What is your best advice on how to make a good impact on the team? Okay, you're starting a new job as a lead engineer. What is... <clears throat> the advice that I can give you to make a good impact on the team. Okay, I'll give you a tactic. I'll give you, I'll give you a tactic um, and I will give you a theory. Uh, what type of job is it, by the way? Uh, lead engineer. But I mean, what type of industry, I should have said. Did, 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 did they say, uh, are no. they saying? What type of industry? Yeah, what type of industry do you work in? The Quality engineer. Quality engineer, okay. So you're going to come in as a leader of a team. Um, yes, to make a good impact, what I would do first is not talk a lot. You know, be humble and learn about each of the people. If you can, take the time to stop by each person and personally introduce yourself and touch them. So write down touch them. Uh, on a, a What type of touch? <laughs> a personal touch. You know, touch them on a emotional level and on a physical level. Tr take a moment to stop by and introduce yourself to each one of the people and use their name three times. You know, hi, Dan, it's nice to meet you. You know, well, tell me, Dan, blah, blah, blah. Well, when you meet somebody, if you say their name three times, they will feel a connection with you. And it's very simple to say somebody's name three times and it will help you remember names. So if you, for example, if you have a problem remembering names, I'm gonna write that down for next episode, uh, but, Generally, analytical people, and it sounds like you may be in that category, have a problem understanding or remembering people's names. And so they'll say things like, you know, I'm bad with names. No, you're not. <laughs> you know, so, but if we, uh, if, 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 when we meet somebody, if you say, you know, hey, I'm Dan, what's your name? And they say, I'm, I'm Jerome. Nice to meet you, Jerome. So tell me, Jerome, yada, yada, yada. And then that's twice. When you say goodbye, you say, it was nice to meet you, Jerome. Having used their name now three times will dramatically increase the likelihood that you will remember it. And because they have heard the, their own name come out of your lips three times, they can't help but feel a connection with you, especially when you touch them. When you touch somebody, uh, and I'm serious when I say that, I don't care what HR says, touch them. Uh, there are still three legal areas where you can touch people and they can't really sue you for it. So what are those three legal areas, Andrew? <laughs> what are those three areas? Uh, hand? No, you can still touch people on their hand. But that's not what I'm referring to. You can't touch someone on the top of their hand and say hi. What are the when? Do you mean like body parts? Or body like, parts. Okay. Yeah. What are the three body parts? Uh, back. No, you sicko. Try again. <laughs> well, there's no other place. That's okay. There's no other place besides your back that you can touch people, Andrew. That's okay. I don't think so. <laughs> there's the, the but the back is okay. The small of the back as they walk through a door. That's what you can do, by the way, to release a... Uh... Shoulder, elbow. Shoulder and elbow! There's one more! Arm. <laughs> arm! Thank you very much. Back of the arm, shoulder and elbow. Now, that does not mean, Andrew, that I can caress you up and down from your shoulder to the... You know, I can't do that. But I can, for example, when you're greeting these people, if you were to say, it was nice to meet you, and you tap them on the shoulder, or that's the elbow, shoulder, elbow, back of the arm, a tap. Doing that, just a little tap, they... They will not notice it. If people notice that you touch them too much and say that you're too touchy, you are. But that tends not to be the case with almost anybody, unless they are, you know, really touchy and need to back off a bit. People will tell you, 
when you touch somebody, that creates an instant surge of things like serotonin and oxytocin in the brain. And remember when a baby, for example, bonds with his mother uh, or her mother, when a woman best breastfeeds with a baby, the bonding process that takes place is a chemical one where the, the brain of the mother and the baby start to release huge doses of these bonding chemicals uh, that make them feel like, God, where have you been all my life? You know, I don't, I can't imagine my life without you. You and I are bonded on like, you know, like, do you watch those, those Twilight movies? Yes, I do. Of course you did. Those were the ones where the, with the vampires and the werewolves and when they imprinted the werewolves on one another, that's like what we do when we touch people. When the mother is breastfeeding her baby, the levels of the same chemicals, the bonding chemicals that have, you know, they include things like phenylethylamine and oxytocin and serotonin. The levels are seen almost nowhere else in nature, except for when we are petting our dog. The brain of the dog and the person release those chemicals in almost the same quantities as the mother does and the baby does when they are breastfeeding. So the reason I mention that is because two things. One, when you touch somebody on any level, just a, a waiter who touches his or her customer makes more in tips than waiters who do not. If you're a server, you know, as you put something on the table, if you can touch somebody on the shoulder as you do that, you know, just a, a brief little tap, they won't remember that you touched them. They will feel a bond with you and tip you more. I'll, I'll tell you that. Uh, when you, the reason I mentioned the dogs thing is because I believe we are missing out. I can't understand why there is not a research lab on the corner of every block in the world trying to figure out what is the connection that human beings have with dogs because there's no other animal in the world that relates to us on a biochemical, chemical, conscious, subconscious, unconscious, on every level like a dog does. They're the only other, uh, they're the only animal in the whole world that cares what we have to say and wants to hear more of it. You know, most of the time people don't even care what we have to say, but dogs do. Why are we researching that, powers that be? Next question. Oh. <laughs> uh. So, so touch, touch every person that you deal with when you start that job, touch them, use their name three times. Oh, and the, the other specific tactic is do something if you can, like, this is going to sound strange. If you're the, you know, if you're the grand poobah, think of the most menial task that people do at work, like, you know, sweep the floor, clean the toilets, you know, the, you know, clean clean up in the lunchroom and do that. You know, like if you can wash dishes in the lunchroom and if people will see you do that and they'll be like, what is, you know, that. And if anybody asks you, Hey, you know, we have people to do that. You don't have to do that. You'll be like, I don't mind. I love helping out so that you can demonstrate that you are willing to do any job that you would ask any other people to do and that you bring the dignity to the job, not the other way around. So I would recommend that as well. Uh, what's the best way to learn how to think on your feet? The best way to learn how to think on your feet is doing whatever it is that you believe you have to think on your feet. Doing whatever it is over and 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 over again. Stand-up comics will tell you, for example, and public speakers like myself will tell you, there's only what, what? <laughs> there's, there's only so many new situations in the universe. You know what I mean? There are only so many questions that will take you off guard and that you will have in a lifetime. Most of the questions that you will get, most of the things, the situations that come up that appear to be spontaneous when you watch somebody deal with them, most of them, it's a pattern because the universe is all about patterns. There's nothing new ever. And so when you start to just do whatever it is over and over and over and over and over and over again, people might, uh, people might believe that you're dealing with a question that just came up from the audience that, that must have taken you off guard for the first time. That is almost never the case. There's always going to be some pattern that you can learn. Uh, like today, you know, every question that I got, I've had to deal with that question some in some way in the past. And in addition to that, know your subject matter. Because if you know your subject matter, like I am, I'm confident in my spirit that I can answer questions that may be new because there's a foundation to what I know the, to be the truth. And that is, like I was talking about before, if, if you do or say whatever it is that you're saying or doing, with love, if you infuse it, you know, if, if, if I have to go up and speak, I had to, 
I've had to speak on so many different topics you wouldn't believe it. You know, I've had to sell mattresses. I've had to, I've had to hypnotize groups of uh, hundreds of people, and I had no, I had zero minutes of experience. I had to literally read a hypnosis script standing at a podium and hope that it worked when I had an audio, when I had an auditorium filled with people. And I remember I was shaking so much, and I looked over the podium. Uh, and there were hundreds of people like this. And my brother in the background, by the way, going, ha, ha, ha. And then he said he could, it was all he could do to resist running down the aisles and screaming, what's wrong with you people? Booga, booga, booga. He couldn't have done that. Because I remember thinking at the time, you know, I'm going, I have to help these people and infuse whatever it is that I'm saying or doing with the love that is inside of me, but not part of me. As long as you know, I know the basis of what I'm supposed to be teaching I know the reason I'm really here and I keep doing this over and over and over again and see the patterns that come up, you will be confident because it's very difficult. If you're telling, for example, the person you love the most, you know, like think of who is who it is that you that you you love. If you're telling them about how you love them and what you think about them, and they were to ask you questions, you know, like, well, what if this happened or what if that happened? I'm sure you could confidently answer each and every one of them as if you had practiced it a million times because you know how much you love them. You know, so it's kind of the same thing. I'm going to that same place. And what could you possibly say to me that would throw me off? I know you with a capital K. And if I know the people that I'm talking to and I know what we're talking about with capital Ks, we're good. You're, we're good. You know, even if I stumble or stutter, we know, <laughs> you know, okay. Any new power phrases? Yeah, any new power phrases. Um, give me an example of, of where you want it for. You know, like what would you like the power phrase for? What situation? Because we there generally tends to be a danger phrase first before the the. Yeah, yeah. I have two power phrases for you. Yes. No. Oh, okay, because <laughs> I was just talking with the lovely Anna. Anna, I need to get you your materials. Okay, so I was talking to the lovely Anna and. I, I apologize if I just exposed you instead of exposing myself. Um, a power phrase that's very common, that this was not actually Anna's, but I'm going to give you this anyway. Does that make sense? You know, people at work tend to say, if you're a new supervisor or manager, this is another tip for the one who's going to be new. Don't ask people, does that make sense? Because when you say to somebody, does that make sense? What you're saying is, does that make sense to you? Or are you stupid? You know, that's what people hear, you know, or are you dumb? I, I do not doubt that that is not what we mean to say. You know, nobody means to, well, not what my mom does. Most of us don't mean to say, does that make sense to you, dumb, dumb? But that is how people feel when they hear that. Therefore, say instead, what am I leaving out? You know, I know there's some version of, what am I leaving out? I, I know there's something I'm missing. Do you know what it is? Because while people don't like to admit what they do not understand, they love to tell you what you're doing wrong. They love to tell you what you have left out. And so if you use some version of, I know there's something I forgot to tell you or something I'm missing, you will get the result you're looking for, but much more quickly and effectively than if you were to say, does that make sense? And then finish the sentence, to you. You know, it's like I, I did a video on how sometimes we have to learn how to finish the sentences of the people who are communicating with us. Like a lot of people will say to us, if you're in a relationship, I'm just not ready to commit. I'm just not ready for a relationship. I'm not ready to settle down or get married. Those types of phrases, especially when they come from men, you need to realize you should finish them with, with you. So when a, you know, when a man says to you, for example, I'm not ready to commit, what he means is to you, or I'm not ready to get married to you, or I'm not ready for a relationship with you. That's what he means, you know, because when you break up with him after years of, you know, of, of a relationship and you see them then marry the first person after you and you're like, wait a minute, you said you weren't ready. Did you finish the sentence? With you was the, was the sentence. But uh, the reason I say that is because many times we have to finish people's sentences, learn what's missing, fill it in. Then there's no blaming other people. You knew, you were warned. They told you, I'm not ready for a relationship with you. Uh, another uh, power phrase and danger phrase that we talked about with the lovely Anna uh, is, why don't you? You know, people will say things like, why don't you try her on her cell phone? Why don't you do that yourself? Why don't you? And instead of telling, which can rub people the wrong way, you know, when many times we are simply saying, hey, why don't you do that? You know, I don't understand why you're not following these instructions. Why aren't you doing it this way? 
Instead, ask people, have you tried? Or tell people, for example, what I would do is, uh, or what I do is. For example, Anna and I were talking about, uh, not Anna, this is not Anna, but let's say that, um, let's say that Andrew were to write me, he were to call me up and say, Dan, could you do me a favor? On my computer at work, I, uh, I, I left the spreadsheet open and I forgot to bring the shopping list with me at the grocery store. So could you quickly open up my computer and tell me what's on that list? I could say to him, why don't you just go online to the, pay, uh, to the iCloud and research the document yourself? Or I could say to him, oh, I can't do that because I'm already scheduled to do other things right now. However, what I do is go to iCloud.com, look up the document, and you will have the exact same information that you wanted for me, but you'll get it quicker. And I'll throw in a benefit statement at the end. So tell people exactly what, to, what you would do, what to do without using the words, you know, what you should do is, or what have you tried, or, you know, do this. Just say, well, what I do is. Then tell people what to do step by step, because if they're asking you to do it, you have to assume you don't know how, you don't know how easy it is, and that you'd be, already you would have the information if you just did it this way. So I'm gonna tell you that, give you the benefit of that you'd already have the information. And if they know that, you know, if somebody is purposely asking you to do work that is, you know, ben beneath your pay grade and they're trying to, you know, show you, you're going to do some things that I ask you to do because that's your job here. If that's what they're testing you, you know, if, if that's the test they're giving you, let's see how far they can push you into servitude. Make sure to let people know where your boundaries are, because if you get roped into that too much, that is about you. Remember, it's always about you. So, uh, uh, th so those, those are going to be your danger phrases and power phrases for today. What I do is, is a power phrase. If somebody's asking you to do something for them and you think, I don't want to do that. Remember that when you have one answer, people think you have all the answers. So be grateful when people come to you and ask you for things because they think you're competent. It's much better than being someone who's never asked to do anything because people believe them to be incompetent. So that's a gift which comes with a curse. And the curse is people think you know the answers to everything. Tell people how you do things and what the benefit is for them. And you will be amazed at how they will start to do those things for themselves instead of saying, you know, why don't you? And remember, does that make sense? Danger phrase. And the power phrase would be, what have I left out? And remember, you're not asking people, did I leave anything out? I think I might have said that by mistake. Ask people, what have I left out? What have I left unclear? That is, an, that is more of an open-ended question that people will stop and think about rather than like when somebody, you know, you walk into a store and somebody says, can I help you? They want you to say no so they can say good and go back to smoking a cigarette. But if you instead say to people, you know, what brings you in here today? What can I help you with? You're more likely to get a response, you know, so don't ask yes or no closed ended questions. Okay. Any advice for religious conversations when you have Mormons or Jews come often and they seem to want a one side, very controlled conversation? Good question. What advice do I have for religious conversations, such as if you have people who are of Mormon or Jewish faith come and ask you questions or want to start up a conversation and what they're really trying to do. Now, I'm not saying that these people are to do that. If you recognize what the person that you're, to whom you're speaking is trying to do is educate you as to their religion. Does that sound like it? You know, try to show you the light. Uh -huh. the, okay, how do I respond to that? Hmm. That is a gift. If somebody believes, <laughs> if somebody believes that you are worthy enough for them to thinking, I'm going to share my God with you. That is something that they're trying to bestow on you as a gift. I would listen and never add to it. You know, I would never say, I would never say anything but, you know, interesting. Thank you. If this is in a work environment, now if you're talking about work, all I would do is listen and say, thank you. You know, thank you so much for sharing that with me. Uh, now as a caveat, I would not maybe use that in my personal life because that is how I got the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. I got on the Jehovah's Witnesses most wanted list and they started to, they started to, I wish I could make this up. They started to park in front of my house with a van and they would open up the van door and the whole congregation got out to stand in front of my gate in front of my house. 
because I thanked them so much for sharing with me. Uh, so on a personal level, I, I think you can say whatever you want, you know, say, well, thank you for sharing that with me, Re recognizing it's always a gift. You know, when, when the Jehovah's Witnesses come to my door, I do recognize they hoofed it. You know, they will walk for miles and they believe that they are sharing the most sacred, wonderful thing that they have with other people. So I got to hand it to them. You know, I'm not that dedicated to so many things, but I also don't want them. Hey. <laughs> I also don't want them necessarily, you know, interrupting my romantic time on a Saturday night or a Sunday morning. Therefore, eventually, you know, if somebody won't stop, I think it is effective and appropriate to say to somebody, you know, I hold it, you know, <laughs> you, one second. While I really appreciate the fact that you would share that with me, something so intimate to you, that conversation is something that I prefer to have in a more private environment, or I prefer to keep my own beliefs private and I don't share them uh, with someone I just met. If it's, you know, like somebody at work or for some client, you know, thank you for sharing that with me. I do not share that type of information or have those conversations in a public environment. I don't have those outside of the home. I don't talk about that with people who are not part of my congregation. Whatever you want to say is okay because somebody else introducing that subject like I talked about before, when you break the rules, you know, when somebody breaks the communication rules with you, all, all bets are off. You can tell people things that would, under normal circumstances, maybe be breaking the rules, you know, yourself, but you have now broken the rules, all bets are off. I can tell you in a savvy way, I'm not discussing that with you. That is something that's private to me. So you can do that, but I would just remember, you know, remember, before you say anything, you know, say it in a loving way. Pretend that, if because it doesn't appear as though, you know, most of us don't feel as though that's a real gift people are sharing with us. Remember it is. And imagine that they are sharing with you what's the most sacred, wonderful thing to them. And don't make them feel bad about that, you know? Because what I give to you, I am giving to my brother. And I don't want to make my brother feel bad. You know, because he's kind of, he, he overshares. Ugh. Okay. Um, I think we're about done. By the way, we're about done. I apologize. I think we're going to have to move some of our subjects to next week. So that's the way the ball bounces here. This is about, you know, this is how live, live coverage goes. So before I close, because I, I do realize other people have things to do. Is there something that anybody's writing? Uh, uh, like shout out to them? Yeah. Anything specific that I should, you know, have a shout out to? Okay. Good advice. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, Anybody from a special part of the country? Any? Do we have any members online right now? No, we don't. Why not? Okay, so don't forget, you can always become a member of Dan O'Connor Training. And if you do that, you will go up to the top of our chat list and you can send... I'm still learning about this, but you will be the first one for us to see and we will directly answer any questions that you have. They ask, can I hire you as a consul consultant? Yes, you can hire me as a consultant. If you go to Dan O'Connor Training, uh, there, go to the store at Dan O'Connor Training, and there are different options to hire as a consultant, either on site, which means I go to you and your organization, or we can do one-on-one -on -one coaching, which is live, uh, like on Skype or Zoom. Uh, both of those are options, or all of the above. Uh, so yeah, I do. I used to not do that because, as I told you, I had I had a fear of of becoming too intimate with other people and exposing myself to them. Uh, and I have uh, overcome that with the help of, uh, I guess you guys, so thank you for that. But I do now offer both individual and uh, group cons. I've always offered group on site, but now I do it in, on an individual basis as well. Uh, Jennifer H says thank you. Thanks, Jennifer Steve H. Morris says thank you. And the Garden of Love and Happiness says, can she adopt you? The Garden of Love and Happiness wants to adopt me. <laughs> I would love to be a child of the Garden of Love and Happiness. <laughs> so thanks. Yeah, that sounds great. Tell me where you are and I might stop by and do a little tiptoe through your tulips. Uh, Susan Hill says thank you. Thank you, Susan. I think that's all. That's all. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. I appreciate it. And I know Andrew does as well. I mean, he's so excited. His board's crooked. So I will see you. <laughs> I will see you all. When do we come back, Andrew? Uh, Tuesday. I'll see you all next Tuesday. In the meantime, please remember to subscribe to this channel. Please support us and uh, subscribe and share this. You know, like if you know anybody who thinks 
you think could benefit from this, please share it. And a special shout out to everyone that I love in my life that is here and gone. And this is Dan O'Connor from Dan O'Connor Training, along with Andrew, Buddy and Maggie. I forgot about them. I don't know where they, but oh, Buddy's asleep. He tends to use this as his nap time. I don't know what message he's sending. Thank you from Wales, UK. Wales, oh, I'm a little bit Welsh. Yeah, that's a little, you know, a little tidbit for the day. So thank you from our, my, my homeland. Mm-hmm. Oh, I guess the garden of peace and love and happiness is probably my homeland, but thank you from Wales as well. So with everybody here at Dan O'Connor Training, thank you, mom and dad. I love you very much. Oh, we forgot to call mom. Well, she won't be surprised. That's nothing new. And we'll probably do that on a recorded segment. We'll do that. On a, we'll get it. We'll get it. We're just totally not expecting it. And I will put that up on a video before I see you all again. Okay. Thanks, guys. We're signing off. I think. Yes. I'm going to try to sign off. Do you know how to sign off, Andrew? No. I'm signing off.